Hey everybody, today's episode is with a new friend of mine, Dan Anir, who is a relationship specialist, relationship counselor, and we talk about conflict and relationship, we talk about the role of emotion in conflict, and we connect conflict in our everyday relationships to what's happening on the world stage. And with that in mind, after our interview, Dan sent me a quote by Carl Jung that I love, and it really connects these things with giant international conflicts and what's going on in our houses, and so I'd just like to read this quote to you. A political situation is the manifestation of a parallel psychological problem in millions of individuals. This problem is largely unconscious. It consists of a conflict between a conscious standpoint and an unconscious one. You find this conflict in nearly every citizen of every Western nation, but one is mostly unconscious of it. And to overcome it, the unconscious must be slowly integrated without violence and with due respect for our ethical values. The discovery of the unconscious means an enormous spiritual task, which must be accomplished if we wish to preserve our civilization. Okay, so here, here's a little bit of context. I see myself, and, and you, I guess, as part of the conflict resolution movement, or business, or industry, And when people think about conflict resolution, especially when I think about it, I'm really interested in large scale conflict resolution. You know, the first thing that comes to mind from my childhood is the whole Israel-Palestine conflict and other, you know, there's like a war in Russia and Ukraine right now. There's all these issues all over the world of power politics, national sovereignty, uh, climate change, the whole COVID thing. These are all issues of more or less successful or failed attempts at resolving conflict. Those are like the headlines. But in our day-to-day life, like I guess maybe one more point. My belief or my, my practice is that it is through practicing conflict resolution and kind of readying ourselves and growing that we'll be ready to engage in those in, in a healthy way in those bigger conflicts. And in our daily lives, the most common conflicts that come up every day are with the people we live with. So your spouse, your kids, your parents, or your roommates, or whatever. And that's what, that's what you specialize in. And so, you know, maybe one, I have a lot of questions, but maybe one way to start is, I'll, I'll give you a couple of assumptions that I'd like you to challenge if necessary, and then help me get into it. So I, I, I see conflict as like, all right, conflict avoidance is bad. It's like not, not great for our long-term goals of getting through things. So, all right. And then the other, like, acting impulsively and reactively to our emotions and sensations, I also see as unskillful, just like being angry. Like I want to hit someone, hitting someone, not great for long-term conflict resolution. So what, what can we do in our daily life to guide us away from those two extremes and towards actually addressing the conflict in a sustainable way? Wow. Well, you've, You've opened up so many options here, right? This this is great. I love this. I love this. Um, because you know, like to almost challenge what you're saying, right? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not endorsing uh, being angry and punching someone. And yet, there is a dynamic that takes place, especially I think uh, more stereotypically with men, where there is this dun- uh, where is there's this tendency to deal with it in real time. You know, get it out. And um, I remember clearly as day many, many years ago when I was running a program back home in Australia and I brought on a friend of mine and he was like a kind of like a support person. And we got into this tense argument. And part of me was like, oh man, you know, this, but we, we both went at it ever so briefly and it was so beautiful after that he held no resentment. He held no ill will. We were both real with each other, but we had enough love, history, care. Now, we didn't punch each other, but briefly it was like quite intense. And um, that's when I started to understand this stereotype of like, you know, women tend to want to say face and, and avoid that directness. And of course, these are stereotypes as exceptions. And, but the way that men, cause I'm a therapist or I'm a ca- trained counselor and, and I'm more on the empathetic kind of end of the spectrum. I wouldn't tend towards that real direct heated 
And that was when I learned, like, okay, there's a way of dealing with things with big emotions in real time that can be productive. Yeah. And if I link it back to my expertise, which is working with couples, you know, when we look at the data on relationships, there's two, there's two big uh, archetypes that I, that I always remember from the data, which is that the couples that, um, that fight frequently, but don't do, do any sort of repair, they, they only last about seven years. Um, so if they're fighting, 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 but never resolve on average, they, they stay together seven, it might be eight years. I forget exactly. So they're kind of like chipping away at the quality of their relationship over the long term. Correct. Well, yes, over the long term, but that's short compared to. Okay, seven years is short. There's another. There's another archetype. Okay. Which is the couple that avoid the conflict, that never address the conflict, uh, and and don't overtly argue. Like you know, friends and family, oh, everything's cool. But there's, they're, they're constantly doing the, let's say, choose your battles. They're choosing no battles when some people choose every battle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's like that old metaphor of you push it under the rug and eventually there's such a lump under the carpet that you trip over the, the bump. And I keep meaning to go back and review the data, but, but it's, it's 16 or 17 years on average that those couples stay together. And this is the stereotypical, we fell out of love. Yeah. We just feel like housemates now, roommates for American language. You know, we feel like roommates and, uh, you know, love doesn't actually die. It, it's that we cease to nurture it. And so you've got to find the balance between, you know, dealing with every conflict head on and making every, a, mole, a mountain out of a molehill in every instance versus, oh, I'm not going to deal with it today. So today we have peace. I'm mm -hmm. not going to deal with it tomorrow. So today we have peace that works in the short term, but over the long term, it's a very, it's a very poor strategy because resentment and stuff. Yeah. Stuff builds. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go back to what you're saying before. I mean, there's, again, there's so many paths here, but I want to figure out in this conflict, big emotions, right? For me, that's what emotions are this, um, like a symptom or a telltale that like something needs to happen, something needs to change. Let's, let's rescue, let's rescue our intervention and, and being direct and honest and taking care of these emotions, but without the, um, without the, without the punching, like how do Correct. we do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. How do we do that? Well, yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a really good question because people think, well, either I express my emotions or I don't. But there's a, you know, like, and some people think, oh, anger, I have anger, or I don't want to have anger. I should, I shouldn't have anger. It's like a self judging of the anger. Mm -hmm. It's like, anger's, no, anger's always real. bad. Anger's, yeah, anger's real. Anger's fine. But what do you do with that anger? Do I start wiggling my finger at you and telling you that you made me angry and you are, or do I say, you know, pick a situation, right? Um, you, your partner didn't, didn't, didn't let you know that, that when they were coming home, you know, maybe they didn't say that they were going to go out for some drinks with friends and they just disappeared. You can say you're an irresponsible person and you're a terrible partner and you, you, or you can say, I'm feeling really angry about not being, and it's usually going to be more than anger. I'm feeling sad, disappointed. I was looking forward to dinner together and really owning that stuff. It, this is kind of, in a way, it's basic conceptually basic, but the skill of doing this is not easy. We, we like to wiggle our finger at people. Yeah. We don't yeah, like to yeah. own it. And it, it, it allows to skip over this whole very difficult part of the conflict, which is self-reflection. Yes. Yes, that's right. And so if you, if you, if you, I always say that the microcosm represents the macrocosm so what happens in 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 our this is what you started with in our daily life it's writ large yeah so when we look at international relations because you you talked about this and i'm like yeah no i totally agree with you got um let's let's be honest right we've got a lot of boys in men's bodies 
that are operating on the world scale that are either po- politicians or or business people and so they're coming into these things in a very interactions in a very adversarial way it's not like hey our country would like this and this you know and of course it's complicated international relations but i often see so many unhealed childhood wounds just coming and we see this in celebrity culture and i honestly feel sorry for a lot of these people that get triggered emotionally triggered in the public eye and they they're not consciously aware of what's happening and you know 10 million people watch them online online or on tv being triggered yeah um so i agree with you that i think it starts at that in our personal relationships and if we can do that well if we can own our stuff well like you and me have a conflict if we can own that well then then that can scale um yeah yeah okay and then so just to get more deeper into it like almost just let's say somebody who's listening to this right now just get out of a fight with their partner yep and they're and they're feeling all of the emotion and it's like it's exactly the situation that you talked about the person went out had a bunch of drinks didn't come home till three in the morning did not notify you know this this whole thing that happens all the time um yep. w- w- what should i do like let's say i'm not i'm not i'm that person and i'm pissed off so yeah you're the hurt person yeah uh, so what I started with, you know, sharing how you're feeling. Yeah. Showing up with those feelings. I, I feel like here, I feel like you're totally irresponsible. That's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not a feeling. Feeling like you're irresponsible. And this is what I talk about a lot. This is, and this is big in the American, um, language yeah. using the word feeling to actually talk about a thought. Yeah. So I'll be coaching I feel like, clients. I feel like you're an asshole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Oh, and and I, I live in Minnesota currently, right? Minnesota nice. I mean, this is the communication method. It's like I feel like blah 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 blah. And it's actually not being direct and not mm-hmm. owning owning our own perceptions. The guy I've been studying with, um uh Terry Real, who created relational life institute he uh relational life therapy and relational life institute he talks about saying what i'm making up about you is so what i'm making up about you anchor is that is that you're an asshole right Whoa. when you don't notify me when you're not and you don't come home what i'm making up about, and so you're really owning that and that's that's, that's awesome. quite a shift for people that's really that's amazing yeah because almost anything I say in that moment, it would be more accurate if I started with what I'm making yeah. up about you is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you can say, like, I feel like you're a selfish, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, and you can really own that, though. And you can simultaneously say, like, I know consciously that this isn't true, but this is the message that's transmitted to me when you don't check in, when you just go out and get drunk. You know, I, I get this scenarios you said it happens a lot i get it a lot and especially when there's kids in the mix so it's like he goes out he drinks he can and it can be her i've had both and and then he's hung over then he's not present for the kids not very helpful <laughs> not very helpful um yeah so owning that but not but you know so i'm 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 suppose i'm talking about not coming out with the really aggressive side which is what you were kind of asking about but often people go the other way too mm-hmm they don't express it mm-hmm. or they can, my, my impulse traditionally has to be the very logical, rational, respectful, reasonable. So very controlled and not actually show the emotion, like, oh, the emotion's going to muddy the waters. It's like, no, sometimes your partner or your friend, whoever it is, needs to feel a bit of that emotion. Like, and, and the other part of this often for the partner that's at home, they're feeling anxious. Right? Oh, did my partner have a crash? Did they have a car crash? What's happened to them? Are they at the hospital? I've had people calling hospitals like, where's my partner? You know, and they're just sitting there drinking, sometimes taking cocaine, getting up, all sorts of stuff, right? And and this, again, back to Terry Real, but this is what he calls grandiose behavior. So this is shameless behavior. They have no shame. They're not thinking about their partner. They're only thinking about themselves. Grandiose. Grandiose. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So do you, do you have a history with meditation? 
I do actually, yes. Okay, so that's that's an interesting part of my story, and it may I'm curious if it relates to you as well. Where I think I had this narrative somehow through my years of meditation and yoga that I could or should be above or beyond emotion, mm. which contributed to like suppressing it and being like, oh, actually, um, you know, many other people would be pissed off right now, but I am just so enlightened that yeah. I'm not pissed off right now. And that'll help me avoid this conflict. Yes. Yes. And I think I had had and i still probably have the same impulse not from meditation um but from that we can go in so many directions but i've i've studied and and learned personality types and so part of my personality type has a defense mechanism to be controlled um and i used to work with traumatized young people and this served me well i could regulate my own nerve and it serves me well now too regulate my nervous system so that so that i wouldn't uh, cause their nervous system to, um, you know, to become more heightened, more stressed and that kind of thing. So it plays a role, but yeah, what I'm realizing is that, you know, I I like to say we should practice critical thinking and critical feeling. So emotions are data, they're valid and they need to be given space. If they're not, you end up with a, you know, an an ulcer in your stomach or something like it it does it does affect you but you don't want unbridled emotional expression and this is what you're asking about like you don't want to just say and we live in a bit of a cultural moment which is starting to swing so we've we're reacting to the to the post-war era of suppressing all our emotions stiff upper lip being tough and we needed to crack you know break out of that But we're starting to get to a point in some corners of society which say all emotion is true and good and valid and should not be questioned. And and I think we need a balance. You know, we need to listen to emotion, uh, but it doesn't get the last it doesn't get the last word. And so what you're talking about sometimes can even be referred to as toxic positivity. I don't know if you've heard that term, but it's like always Zen. Nothing affects me. Nothing impacts me. And, um, I do think it's something to work towards being more Zen, but, but there can be a denial of emotion in that if it's not coming from an authentic, authentic yeah. place. Yeah, totally. It's just, it's just another strategy Correct. To, to avoid yeah. what's actually going on in the moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's one thing to, to not have the emotions and not be upset. Be like, oh, you just ran into my car. I'm not attached to my car. Like it doesn't matter. Absolutely. But if that's not how we feel. Well, then it's the word is lying. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then what's the, so this is a question I get from my clients sometimes is how do you know the boundary between what is like for each of us, how we express or don't express what, what is a healthy expression? Like if I'm, if I'm in this, I've been in this suppression avoidance game for so long and I'm like, no, I think I'm going to, going to tune into this this movement in the culture you're talking about, I'm going to express myself more. I'm going to feel my emotion uh, is saying my emotion. Like I am feeling anger right now. Okay. That's one thing. There's raising the tone of my voice. There's hitting the air. There's throwing a plate. There's all kinds of things that are not directly, I'm not attacking you, but they're, they're different expressions of what I'm feeling right now, using my body and my voice. Yes. What, what, how do I know like what is reasonable? It's a good question. There's no, I mean, there's no one size fits all answer. But what I will say for those of us that grew up and our adaptation for whatever reason to our childhood was to go the suppression route, because there's different ways, but for a percentage of us, we... And trauma, of course, you know, really does this. So if you experience trauma, then there's a degree to which you you separate from your body. You separate from feeling, not just emotions, but feeling in general. Then as you start to come out of this, people talk about this idea, it's like ice. You start to thaw out. And it can be very tumultuous. Hey, I talk actually. I talked to a client not that long ago who who didn't feel for many years, and and I met them. They've started to feel, they started to feel, and and it's like, 
it's very disconcerting and it's like a muscle that you have to be built to, you have to build. And sometimes people can swing the other way for a while. It's this revelation to feel, to express, to ask to have their needs met. Um, and they can go overboard. And so, yeah, I don't think there's a, you know, like a simple way forward. You just want to surround yourself with supports. Yeah. Maybe some counseling, whatever that is. Um, because it looks different for everybody. It depends a lot on that particular person's personality and to what degree does their personality need to outwardly express and process those emotions. I've had quite a few couples where, uh, you know, the woman will say, my husband, my partner is emotionally shut down. He's unemotional. And as I've started to look and delve into both of their personality types, I actually start to realize no, he has a personality that doesn't need to emote. So he might be actually quite sensitive, but he sort of processes his emotions a little more internally, um, if that makes sense. Some of us need, like I'm a person that more needs to express, like if I'm trying to make a decision or I've had a, a conflict and an encounter, I'm going to talk to my wife, I'm going to talk to my mom, I'm going to talk to my mates. I need a pro, I need a like, or I can journal it. Some people can do that a lot more internally and that's, it's not wrong. It's just different. And that was a real revelation for me. Okay. So you're drawing a distinction. I think this is, this is important between having emotions and emoting or expressing. Correct. Correct. So it's not that this guy is not emotional. He could be very emotional, but he's not expressing it. And sometimes that could be bad for him, pathological, but sometimes that could be, he's actually just processing it in a different way without expressing Correct. I mean, a good example would be my father. And I was like, I oh, should I talk about my father, but this isn't actually a criticism of my father. Growing up, I thought he was unemotional. And my father's a social worker by trade. And I know that he was, he, he's retired now, but he was a very good social worker. Like what's, what's happening here? And then as I learned personality and, and other, other tools, I started to understand and I could, you get signs, right? I see some sentimentality. I could see some, I was like, he's feeling, he's not, he's not without feelings. He's not without emotion, but his, the way that his personality operates is that he doesn't have to, you know, he doesn't wear his heart on his sleeve. That's, that's not how he's wired. And because I'm more wired that way, I'm more needing to wear my heart on my sleeve, especially when I was younger, before I learned some emotional regulation skills. Um, so I took my own experience and I think this is what so many of us do. And I projected my experience of life and emotion and thought and projected onto him and many others, I'm sure you you're wrong. Cause you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're not open and, and vulnerable. And, and then I learned actually that's not the highest goal. There's times to be emotion, uh, emotionally expressive. And there's times when it's not appropriate. And, and so we can learn from each other. There's those that can learn to emote more and go, oh, yeah, actually, that's good. And then those of us that need to learn how to, to wind that in and to, to, to choose our moments. And that's why I talk about critical thinking and critical feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so let me maybe just follow that thread a little bit more. I mean, we've done pretty much everything I wanted to do in terms cool. of tying together this conflict in, in relationships. But, but here, if everyone's, everyone's different, I think that's not just a theory. I think we all we all know that we've experienced that. Yeah. But like, if I'm in a relationship with your father mm -hmm. and like, I want to get closer to your father mm -hmm. and I, without trying to change him or project how he should be, mm -hmm. where my way of getting close to people is to be able to understand what's alive for them and what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. And maybe to offer support or maybe just to listen or just to feel like that kind of deepening of that relationship Yes, through, through that sharing. What's the way to do that? So what's the way to experience that deepening? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question because it's so contextual, right? They need to be given space. They like to be, they need to be heard and, and, and understood. And I think there is a process of um, trust building 
And generally speaking, they're quite intuitive to people and their motives. And so the way to do it would be for you to show up in your authentic self. And the more authentic and real and grounded you are in your in the wholeness of who you are, the more that that will actually make them feel comfortable and safe to show up in the wholeness of who they are. So for me, I think it's a lower bar for me to be ready to open up emotionally with people. But for people that I suppose their emotions are a bit more t- tucked away, tucked inside, they need to feel, yeah, they're just given that space, you know, pressuring. And, and this is what I see with couples, like pressuring them to open up, to be vulnerable, setting the agenda about how they should emote or how they should show up with emotions it's a sure way surefire way to shut them down yeah yeah i feel i feel like i feel very validated right now and that i should get kind of a prize because i i learned how to do that yeah yeah because i think in the beginning when i was relating to those kind of people i would be really high pressure yes and i'm just high pressure in general in many ways but but to be i think i've really developed that like i'm just going to be authentically myself and and demonstrate that being weirdo in each in our own way is totally cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that acceptance for those type of personalities is absolutely paramount. And I put my foot in it in the past because I'm intense. Sounds like, you know, similar to you, like I'm intense. I like connection. I like relationships. I like friendships. And I've had history with people where I've met them and we've got along really well and we've hung out a whole lot and without realizing I thought there was an agreement that now we're kind of you know we're a top five or ten closest friends you know because we've had this history and I've probably project projected a sense of obligation Mm -hmm. Um, because I am a very loyal you know if you become my friend I am very loyal and for you know these other type of archetype of people, um, it's more based on what feels authentic to them. So maybe they did hang out with you a whole bunch for three months and now they're in a different stage of life. They've got different interests. They've got different people that they're connecting with on on other things. And again, the surefire way to end those relationships is to try and pressure them and say, well, you're my best friend now and we have to hang out every Monday night and, you know, this kind of thing. It's like they, 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 they kind of flow with the wind a bit more. And again, I'm overly, overly generalizing here. Um, where there are other people that are not like that. You will meet them and you'll build some history and they'll literally be at your birthday in 30 years time because that's, that's the way that they're wired. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, interesting stuff to, to sort of think about and to, to learn how to adapt so you can actually have a broad array of connections and relationships you don't always just hang out with the same type of people yeah which is what i want yeah me too me too yeah it's probably why we run podcasts and talk to all sorts of different people totally yeah yeah Yeah. thank you so much dan and just to close this out i know a lot of people who are listening to this have been married are married are going to get married or at least in a long-term partnership this is your area of expertise you deal with a lot of problems. Is there one thing you'd like to say to people that could make a positive impact on their lives? Absolutely. One of the things that's been most helpful for me to understand, and I I like getting to the core of things. And one of the things I've realized when it comes to couples and relationships is that the thing is not the thing, right? So people come in and they say, He's always leaving his dirty boots by the front door and I'm sick of it. Or she's always nagging me to so on and so forth. And it, and when I first started working with couples, a, a, a few times, luckily I got some good training early on, but a few times I, I started to buy into this. Okay, we need to work out what are we going to do about these boots? What are we going to do about this situation? Because clearly, you know, and, 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 and they'll try and pull you into the argument. But what I've learned over time is that the thing is not the thing. So it's not actually about that. That is almost the barometer of of where that couple's connection, uh, we technically call it 
fondness and admiration, where their level of fondness and admiration is at. Because if you're deeply in love and feeling connected with your partner, he could probably leave his boots by the door every day for the rest of their lives and you'll be able to cope with that. And also, if they're deeply in love with you, if you mention to them, hey, I don't like your boots there, a lot of the time they're going to take that on board and have the capacity to make a change because they're making a change out of love. And so what I'm always working with, with couples is going, okay, what are the issues? And where's your fondness and admiration at? Because if the fondness and admiration drops too low, you literally can't deal with the issues. And you'll, you'll, you'll resolve one issue and then 10 more will pop up. But once the fondness and admiration, the connection, the closeness is bigger, like not all, but so many of the issues just melt away. Mm. They just literally don't seem to matter for the people. Or they might go, oh yeah, that's annoying, but whatever. Um, you know, he comes home, he gives me a hug and a kiss. We spend half an hour on the couch. We're connected. We're helping each other pursue our, each other's dreams. Who cares about the boots? Who cares about the this, the that, and the next thing? So, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've come to to see, and it translates pretty much to every couple. There's not really exceptions to the rule in that regard. Fantastic. In such a complex area as human relationships, so nice to have something where there's not exceptions to the rule. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And this, and I should just add on that this goes beyond romantic relationships. I mean, if you're having conflict with your boss and you don't have, I mean, we, in relationships, we call this like the marital friendship. If you don't have a degree of friendship with certain people that you're rubbing shoulders with all the time, it doesn't mean you have to hang out all the time, but you know, a, a bit of um, lightheartedness, bit of, Friendship goes a phenomenally long way to then being able to relate in a professional way to, or extended family members, same thing, mother-in-law, father-in-law, bit, bit of tension, take them out for a meal, have a beer together, build a bit of re relationship, a bit of friendship, then deal with the issues and it becomes so much easier. Wow. I love it. I mean, that's, to me, that's just a recipe for what we need as a society. You know, I, Absolutely. I, I took these classes a couple of years ago with this guy, Kern, who Kern Bear, who he, he did a, in my mind, it's a pilgrimage. I think he, he would call it a road trip. Okay. He did a road trip with his son across the country after the Trump election to yeah. try and understand more about different parts of the world, you know, different parts of this country. And that was his main conclusion was if we have these like intense disagreements with people in our communities, they can only be resolved in the context of an actual relationship and to be able to like just argue with someone on the basis of a bumper sticker on their car and try and convince someone of something he's like it's totally insane there has to be this relational container where you actually care for each other before any of the other stuff even becomes relevant or possible that's right and often over food there's something magical that happens when you share a meal with someone yeah Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dan. No worries. Thank you for having me. This has been really fun. So we're new to YouTube and we would love your feedback. Please comment, subscribe, follow, tell all your friends and let us know what you think.